Peter McCaig for speaking yesterday. Uh, I'm presenting on behalf of myself and my colleague Alex Adamson. We work in data management within the Heritage Directorate of Historic Environment Scotland. And in the context of this talk, Historic Environment Scotland is a three year old organisation formed by the uh, bringing together of the, the, the Historic Scotland and the Royal Commission of Historic Monuments of Scotland. So uh, I'm really talking about the work that's gone on within the Heritage Directorate of the organisation <laughs> and the need to address uh, a, the wider issues of making data open in the organisation. So what is open data? Uh, that one. Um, Tim Berners-Lee defined it as uh, five star data. So you have a single uh, one star is just making information available prior to format, PDF, you can read it and attach, do very much with it. Two star in a text format, uh, Excel is in a proprietary software, Microsoft Word type thing. Three star, CSV, and that's probably the realistic uh, uh, level that we can aim for most of the data. But we do have some four star, five star data. Our terminologies, which I'll talk briefly about later, which is linked data uh, format. And it's linked to other data sets. Um, it's non personal data, it's non commercially sensitive, it's easily discoverable, it's accessible to anyone, and uh, able to be freely reused and distributed by anyone. It's made available via the internet in an electronic format, which supports ready reuse with open licensing. Scottish Government definition 2015. Scottish Government published their open data strategy in 2015, which again, it's, it, it, it supports wider legislative initiatives designed to make our information, public sector information, accessible for reuse to help grow the digital economy. And there's various legislation. Uh, it uh, supports Data Protection Act, Freedom of Information Act, Environmental Information, I guess it's Inspire. Inspire is one of the great things that's helped unlock our data. Uh, benefits of open data strategy, the Scottish Government see it as um, making data open, support delivery of improved public services through public bodies, making wide use of the data, wider society, uh, social and economic benefits through innovation, use, innovative use of the data. There are a lot of people out there who can do a lot more than we actually have the time to do with our own data sets. And it's also about accountability and transparency of services. Um, we're aiming to deliver a data vision for Scotland by 2020, which recognises the value of data and that other people can use that data. So, say it's by opening up data, increasing access to usage, and it drives, drives and stimulates the economy, new, new insights and knowledge from combining data sources in a way that we just don't have the time to do in our own organisations. As an organisation, we need to consider what information we have, our information relating to our regulatory role, but also our archival role, information about our services, how to engage with us. And we make a lot of information available already online in Canmore, the designated data sets, historic land use assessment, mapping our properties and care. And we provide information about the historic environment. And we have lots of other corporate uh, publications, the corporate plan, annual account strategies. These are all documents that can fall within the open data strategy. And it falls within the context of commercial confidentiality, information which we may strategically de decide to monetize. So books, we sell images through Canmore, it's an image library which people can browse, they can download images for use, personal use, but we then sell images for publications. We need to develop our own corporate strategy through PSI, which is Public Sector Information Regulations, uh, which up until now have largely ignored, um, have excluded uh, archives from, from the full rigour of those uh, regulations. We also need to prioritise. We can't do everything at once. We have to decide what we can publish, what's already published online, but it's freely downloadable in a non propriety format. Uh, freely available online, but you can't download, and then the, the material we haven't published. So there's a lot to think about across an organisation, five directorates and 1,200 odd staff. And then we also need to think about the fault formats, whether it's in PDF, HTML, CSV, linked data, link data formats, and for the spatial information, uh, what, what format's appropriate for, for publishing that information, actually what's actually reusable. Um, and publishing is not the sole objective. We want people to be able to, to locate and understand our data. We actually have multiple websites with download sections. You can go to different places to find different parts of the data that we hold. Um, 
we need to we need to develop an architecture that allows people to find our data consistently, easily, and consistently. And we need to implement DOIs to make sure that inf information is findable in the long term. So there's a persistent address for each item that we we, we publish. As I say, Inspire is very much one of the big drivers for change. A lot of our information is spatial data. Everything in Canmore has a, has a location. Uh, in the early 2000s, we were very restricted what we could do with our data. The Ordnance Survey claimed um, copyright over any, any information that was created against the paper maps. It was then transferred into digital format. Inspire came along and started to unlock the... Um, the restrictions on what we could do with our data. It then said we must make our protected sites available through an open license. That led the Ordnance Survey to developing exemptions. Uh, the Ordnance Survey also started to think about open data products. So we're now moving into a world where they're even considering in 2018 opening up OS Master Map. So there's a lot more information to, coming along. And alongside that, there's now the Ordnance Survey now accept the presumption to publish public sector data within this framework. So it's a very important directive and why we're doing things. And this led, as I say, to, to releasing our protected sites data sets, so that's the scheduled monuments, listed buildings, uh, but also the CAMO, the National Monuments Record, National Record of Historic Environment, as discoverable data sets, web map services and web feature services that people can take and use in their own systems without restriction. Uh, and we use that information to publish on PassMap, we take our, the services we, we drop that information into PassMap, so people can, can go to a, do a, undertake a location-based search, find, find information about scheduled monuments, listed buildings, Canmore records, most of the historic environment, rec uh, most of the historic environment records from local authorities on PassMap. They can do a search, they can look at the, res the results, see, they can view a CSV file of the results, they can download that CSV into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so the uh, Column highlighted in green, that that's the, we, we've, we've identified that the license that's released under an open government license for the Historic Environment Scotland data sets. We still have to work with the local authorities to, to change from an end user license to an open license for uh, the HER point data sets. But that's just a discussion. We just need to work that through the system. And we can also drop the information into a KML file, which will then drop into uh, Google Earth. And that's the same process for Canmore. You can search for a type of monument, get the results. Bottom of the page, you can take, download, you can download a, 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 up to a thousand records at a time. And it's the same process. Drop it into an Excel spreadsheet. It's all covered under the licensing secure at the top. And again, drop it into K, a KML file, drop it into Google Earth. In terms of the, our archive items, we've got 300,000 sites. We have an uh, associate collection of over a million, million and a half archive items. Uh, at the moment, the digital proportion, you can only download PDF files and we need to work harder to, to make more and more of our data, the data sets available. And we also have, a, this is where, where we start having multiple platforms for where we can get data. We've, we've defined the site area extents for, for most of our, our archaeological records in Canmore. And they're available via a separate download page in the Canmore mapping layer. And then it's the terminologies we use to define sites. Um, that's available in a thesaurus. You can download, do, do, undertake a download, uh, undertake a search of that, produce a distribution map, and then go back to the Canmore site page and download those records. Uh, so the terminologies we use to, um, to, 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 to index information. We work with uh, historic England, English Heritage, as it was at the time, Historic England in 2013, 2014, and with the University of South Wales, my colleagues upstairs <laughs> speaking about that, uh, speaking about the, the work that University of South Wales have done, in the Seneschal project where we published uh, 14 vocabularies from England, Scotland and Wales as linked data uh, in 2013, 2014, and this year we've just added our period terminologies for Scotland in a draft format. Uh, and that's available as five star linked data in a variety of formats, which you can then download. It's just a nuisance out there, JSON, turtle, triples. Um, and people are using that in their own systems. There's widgets that uh, Kerry's d developed to allow people to access it. And the redevelopment of Oasis, which Tim looks after, is using the, these linked data vocabularies to provide vocabulary control in the redevelopment of Oasis. 
and the same vocabularies will be used to uh, underpin the, the development cross-searching of regional research frameworks so that we're, we all know what we're talking about. We're defining the same object across different platforms. So it's encouraging increasing interoperability of systems. It's probably the, 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 the most advanced we, we are in terms of linked data in, in HES. Uh, but there's a lot more information that we need to do more with. So it's publication of scientific data in print format. This is uh, on the left is Discovery and Excavation. Publishes an annual um, series of uh, annual report of the radiocarbon dates uh, 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 created in Scotland. It reads the immediate impact of reaching the audience. It's a digest of information. And it's established reference system in print, but it's not easily reused. Um, so if you want to do statistical Bayesian modeling, you'd have to go to DES and copy in the information individually into the systems. And it's not always consistently referenceable. It's sometimes missing. We've We've moved to, to take a, creating an online database of the radiocarbon dates linked to the relevant sites in Canmore so people can view the list of radiocarbon dates associated with the Canmore record and then see the individual record. And in one or two cases, you can actually see the, the, a PDF copy of the report that the labs submitted so you can see the graph, the analysis. Where we want to get to with this is that you'd add a download button so that somebody can then download those results and take it and reuse in their own systems recalibrate the dates if they so wish. And the same with uh, PDF reports. We now receive, we, I think we've got about 5,000 records in Oasis that come through from commercial archaeology. Uh, the report's PDFs. This is a very old uh, excavation report from Discovery, uh, from the Priest of Galway. It's a map as a site location showing the excava uh, a series of excavations. Modern survey, this is uh, the commission survey that's in Kilda just captured using digital uh, DGPS. We can drop that into our own uh, GIS and we can use it in a publication. But because it's data, we can then combine it and reuse it with other data sets to, to create a, a, a map of all the archaeological sites that we've, we've, we've surveyed in the, uh, over the 20 years. And eventually that will go online. It'll be published in Scottish Spatial Data Infrastructure so that uh, people can find it online easily and they can then drop it and reuse it in their own systems. So we need to be making the digital information consistent and publish it through open channels. Uh, on the landscape scale, we've uh, recently completed, three years ago now I think, uh, completed historic land use assessment map for Scotland. Uh, that's got its own website, people can go there, they can find out about how we classify monument uh, landscapes and they can view a map. Uh, so this is this is the HLA map. You can just have a single view of the map. You can you can view uh, you, you can open up a second portal. You can view the data online. You can interrogate it. You can see see the information about how we've classified landscape. I query to get a simple answer, but we can also download it. Download it again. It's under an end user license with the Ordnance Survey because we've traced information off the Ordnance Survey map, and we need to work out work with the Ordnance Survey to to make it an open, accessible data set. I just contrast with uh, Eng England, the uh, ADS holds the historic landscape classifications on their, their uh, library. Um, you can read the report, there's reports, we don't have reports in Scotland, and you can view the images, but they're only still images, they're PDFs. So that's a view of the map, I, I, can, I can see that, I can, I can read the classifications, but I want to, I want to see how the land, land use landscape in a slightly different concept, how the land use and landscape changes over the Cheviot Hills, which is on the border ridge here. I can, as I say, I can query the data, but in England I just got a flat file and I can't actually see the legend. So we need to be thinking all the time about making our information in the most accessible formats and PDFs are all for <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that's me. Uh, we've still got a long way to go. Uh, within Historic Environment Scotland, there's a lot of debate about what we need to do about open data. We need to get it recognised across the organisation. We're working on our open data plan. That's gone up through our legal and compliance people. We need to improve the visibility of our open data on, on, on Canmore and other portals, make, make people more aware of actually this is what we have out there already. We're already doing a lot. We also need clear and consistent, consistent licensing of our data. It's not always obvious. 
you go to Camor, there's actually nothing that says what the licensing is about using that data. Open data is the future, it's coming. There's Scottish government drivers for 2020, it's the UK Geospatial Commission 2025. It's all about encouraging reuse of that data, allowing people and enabling people to do things. So it's the yellow brick road, we're about there <laughs> to start. That's me, thank you. Thank you.